Well, good morning. My name is Malcolm Young. I'm the Dean of Grace Cathedral. Welcome to the Forum. We're so blessed today to be celebrating the Summer of Love with Joel Sullivan, um, a man who really was there and uh, it has lots of stories to tell about it. Joel was a music critic for the San Francisco Chronicle for decades. He first started working at the Chronicle when he was 17 years old. Um, and uh, I've been reading his Summer of Love book for the last two weeks. And just it's one of those books you want to take your time with because you, you don't want to rush through everything. You want to um, really take it all in. Um, so we're really grateful to have you here today, Joel. And Thank you. Um, looking forward to your stories about everything, what, we, what it was like. You know, it's so great to be here to talk about this in Grace Cathedral because you know, Malcolm, that Bishop Pike was one of the very few civic leaders to welcome hippies. Yeah, right, right. This You're was right. the one of the only places uh, where a powerful person in San Francisco spoke out in behalf of the hippies and welcomed them. Yeah, you're exactly right. And, and the feeling here was just a feeling of newness, too. And so it, it, the cathedral is really only half finished from the 30s on. And in the 1960s, mid-1960s was when it was finally done. So 1965, just the same time that all these things were coming together, was when the cathedral was finished. So all the art that's in there, all the, the vestments that people wore, were really influenced by the time. They were really trying to be both modern and ancient at the same time. So you're right, um, um, Bishop Pike was right there. and What you know, a 60s guy. Yeah, he really was. Really a 60s guy. I don't yeah. know if you're familiar with Bishop Pike, but you know, he got involved in parapsychology and was very yeah. much prominent. He had a seance on live television to speak to his deceased son. And then, yeah. of course, had that bizarre uh, end to his life where he wandered off in the desert trying to right. see what Jesus was doing in the wilderness. Yeah, yeah. But uh, he was also a very early champion of what we uh, uh, call gay rights now. Uh, there was no such term in those days. And uh, like I said, welcome the hippies. Yeah, you know, and his, this his, is a San Francisco bishop in the he 60s. He is, he is. <laughs> his family's still here. They're here every single Sunday. So his daughter and his grandson are always here um, and serve here. And so it's, it is, you're right. It's a real connection to that time and place. You know, people burning draft cards, all, all that stuff is, um, you know, we really had our, our heart, hearts in the 60s mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. Well, this was a so you were growing up in, in, in Berkeley, though, um, before the 60s. <laughs> I hesitate to use the term growing up. Yeah, good point, good point. <laughs> My you parents were... raised me. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's a good... That, that, you, you, I but it, so, so it, as you were a child and, you, and, and th things... I mean, I wonder what signs you saw in your childhood that things like the summer of love were on the horizon. Like what... And now that you look back on it, you can probably notice, like, um, just the beginnings of it. Oh, sure. Well, Berkeley was a very special environment in the 50s and 60s. Um, and early on in the 60s, right in 1960, uh, they firehosed a bunch of protesters right, right, off right. the steps of City Hall. Yeah. And that was the beginning of outspoken uh, political action in the Bay Area. And a number of my parents' friends were wet that day. Yeah. Oh, yeah, right. I can oh, yeah. imagine being My father in was in the labor movement, so he was like, sort of the square uh, conservative in his crowd. Yeah. You know, they ranged all the way out to wild-eyed communists, but there were no Republicans in my parents' circle. Yeah. You know, this is San Francisco, you know, we're very accepting of, 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 of different <laughs> lifestyles, Republicans less so than others. <laughs> So um, what did you learn from your parents as they were raising you? I mean, that, um, that helped you be a, a newspaper man. When well, my father started out as a Hearst man in the 30s. And what he did for the labor unions was he ran the Central Labor Council's newspaper. So my father was essentially a newspaper man all his life. Some of you look like you might have had a union job in San Francisco like in the last 40 years, maybe even subscribed to San Francisco labor. It came yeah, in the right, mail a lot. Right. And that was my father's work. Uh, he was a leader in that whole field of labor journalism. That was something that didn't exist when he started and then became codified and institutionalized, much as when I started writing at the Chronicle, there was no such thing as music journalism. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. So, so how, what led you to, to get a job at the Chronicle, and, and what was it like <laughs> there in the early days? I mean, <laughs> So I had dropped out of high school. <laughs> and... Uh, there was some concern for me amongst my parents and my parents' friends yeah, that I yeah. might be headed toward a criminal life. <laughs> and there's these jobs at the Chronicle called copy boys. And they are reserved for nepotism. You know, so the editor's kids can have a job during the summer vacation. 
And my parents were close friends with Scott and Ruth Newhall. Scott uh-huh. was the editor of the Chronicle. And, oh, yeah, let's put the kid on to work. So I went to work at the Chronicle as a copy boy at 17. Uh, quickly discovered that I could get on the guest list at the Fillmore. Ah, by right. virtue of my and exactly job. press, little press yeah, button. Yeah, pretty much it for me. <laughs> you know, like. So and what the, was your first concert like at the Fillmore? I mean, I just went by there yesterday. Yeah. I was thinking of you as I was going by there. And well, this is a, we got to the, uh, one of our uh, uh, pe- people yeah. here today is at the Trips Festival. That right. was before the Fillmore. That was when uh, Kesey actually hired Bill Graham to produce this thing. And Graham had no idea what was going on. He was super straight. He didn't know what LSD was. He had no idea what the liquid in the garbage can was. <laughs> I, I mean, and, and so there's a, there's a wonderful moment, and the Grateful Dead were just blasted. They, they were so high, they really couldn't play. <laughs> and that happened to them quite occasionally. Uh, and somebody had stepped on Jerry Garcia's guitar and broken the neck. Oh, yeah. I did that once. Uh, super easy. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Jerry's wandering around going oh, like this, and they tell it's time to go to stage. So he goes to the stage, and he sees his guitar broken. And Bill Graham, with his clipboard under his arm, drops to his knees and starts trying to put this totally <laughs> to broken it. guitar together. Yeah. <laughs> and Jerry said that he was just overcome with a feeling of warmth toward this oh, guy. Oh, you loved him so much. <laughs> oh, you know, great. this completely impossible task, and this guy just <laughs> bent down doing it, you know. <laughs> like, oh, isn't that night? No, we're not going to be playing tonight. <laughs> that's great. So that was got, when Jerry met Bill. Oh, that was the, their yeah, first, first time you saw oh, him. Oh, that's yeah. funny. What a great, great introduction. <laughs> um, so, you know, the, the, the big bands that played there, like, where were they? I mean, so, um, I mean they built these ballrooms that seem to be perfect for having experiences like Bill Graham presents his experience. So what was, what, you know, uh, where, what happened to the music scene that, was, that they were built for? Uh, well, the ballrooms go way back, uh-huh. right? I mean, uh, the, the Avalon Ballroom, which has been turned into an architect's office now, uh, was built in 1911, yeah. and it had a sprung dance floor. You know what a sprung dance floor is? Yeah, yeah they, boun- they, they bounce back at you when you dance on them. Yeah. Uh, oh, I like that. And It'd be great the, for basketball. The Fillmore <laughs> goes back to about 1909. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. post-earthquake. Uh, big bands played there in the 30s. Right, exactly. Uh, at the time Bill took over the Fillmore, it was being operated by a fellow named Charles Sullivan, and Charles Sullivan owned cigarette machines all over the West Coast, and was um, a uh, major figure in the Fillmore community. Yeah. And uh, he rented that place. Uh, he, he ran R&B shows through there, like Little right, Richard right. and The Temptations and all that. Uh, uh, and he rented that place to Bill for 60 bucks a night. And in fact, it, it was so uh, common to play that place in what was known as the Chitlin Circuit, that when B.B. King was booked to play there in February of 67 in front of all the hippies, and he'd never played in front of a white audience in his life, it was a moment that changed his career, he had just assumed that it was the same old right, film right, and exactly. he walked in and saw these white people. He was. <laughs> yeah. Bill Graham said, can I get you anything? He says, yeah, a bottle of scotch. <laughs> yeah. So what's the difference between a beatnik and a hippie? Oh, uh, LSD. Yeah, 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 pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So how did how did what was the influence of the, of the for the hippies from people who came before them? Like what, you know, what did they take so, from it? So you know this they... book here that you were reading. Yeah. Uh, I, I interviewed about two hundred people for that book, and almost all of them came from somewhere to San Francisco. Yeah. And every single one, I mean, every single one, one hundred percent said they came to San Francisco because they read On the Road by Jack Kerouac. No. Really? Yeah. Funny. Yeah. So that was the Beatnik Bible. Yeah, right. And it, it describes a cross-country trip, yeah. that destination of which is San Francisco. Right. So San Francisco was sort of described as the mecca of this bohemianism yeah. that was finding its way up from the underground. I mean, bohemianism goes back to the 19th century in yeah. America. Uh, there's always been a sort of group that opted out, and uh, you know that that creates a kind of mindset and mentality, and, and people outside the 
mainstream society sort of throwing bricks and stones in and, you know. So the, the, in the early 50s in San Francisco, that started to emerge from deep shadows into sort of a minor subculture. Yeah. And, and really, you know, located around a few blocks in um, yeah, North Beach. Right. And an interesting thing, you know, uh, some of you may know the, on Pacific, there's a sh Thomas Cara and Sons that sells espresso machines. And, and Chris Cara is Thomas Cara's son. He's, he runs the shop. He's a fantastic guy. Thomas Cara was a soldier in the Second World War who found the Italian method of making coffee to be just fascinating. <laughs> and in 1945, he opened a store at the corner of Columbus and Broadway uh -huh. selling espresso machines, the first such store in the United States of America. Now, that seems like a modest sort of thing, but then you start thinking, oh, he sold those machines to all those coffee shops on Grand right, Avenue right, right. that became the center of poetry, jazz, beatniks, wow. espresso, Thomas Carr, American hero, yeah, that's... San Francisco native. <laughs> that's great. If, if, if you go into Chris's store and, and, and he, he, the door's locked, I love this guy, you know, you have to like knock on his door, <laughs> tell him I said hi. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Tell us a little bit about just like the San Francisco sound. I mean, some, some, the, the, the music groups that were popular in, in this time period and and, and what made them unique, and, 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 and how is it different than some other region? Let me take that question on a little bit broader terms. Um, before we go into biographies of the bands, uh, uh, let me, let me uh, sketch something out for you that's a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, diametric, uh, the, um, diagramic. Um, Chet Helms ran the Avalon yeah, Ballroom. Right. He was sort of the anti-Bill yes. Graham. Uh, and he went out of business and, and right. never cared about money. He was hippie visionary. Right. It was out at Ocean Beach. Later. But yeah. Avalon was at uh, yeah, Sutter no, and Van Ness. But, but, but yeah, yeah, he moved out to the Family Dog. That was another disaster. But yeah, I mean, yeah. Chester's, Chester's, Chester's life was one disaster after another. But, but really, what a gorgeous reading. guy. Yeah, gorgeous yeah, guy. Yeah. So Chester had this down that the Apollonian model of the theater contains a proscenium arch, which is the gateway to the gods through which you uh, view the actions on stage. Yeah, yeah. And there's a us and them divide between the stage, the gods behind the proscenium, and the audience. The Avalon and the Fillmore had no proscenium. And in fact, the stage at the Fillmore today is, is huge compared to the one that was there at the time. It was very short and very small, uh, and there were no spotlights. Yeah. There was a light show that encompassed the audience, the band, the walls, that created a massive environment. There was no light on the band. Yeah. And so Chester, Chet, would explain that that was a Dionysian revel. <laughs> and a Dionysian revel makes no distinction between performers and audience. Yeah. They are all part of the whole. And that's why there's no spotlight, no proscenium. So, you talk about the bands. The bands were pointless. They were, right. they were irrelevant. Yeah. It was the event that was relevant. Right, right, right. Now, over the course of time, American culture seeped in, and people became noted for their uh, star qualities, like a Janis Joplin. Right, right. And bands became fans and became yeah. followers, and, and you know, rather, uh, uh, obviously, the dead began to attract us sort of peculiar group of people right, that went to right. all their shows. Exactly. The Deadheads always took Muni. <laughs> I'm not lying. The, at Winterland, they had a little postage stamp parking lot in the back that always was sold out, packed by 8 o'clock showtime. When the Dead played Winterland, they never sold out the parking lot. It was always half full, and these buses would pull up just jammed full, like rush hour, full of stinky hippies. <laughs> Oh, that's great. I love so the there's deadheads. No, I like that. I love that image of just like, and so then what happened when that star quality creeped into it? I mean, how well, did that they, change the Well, the whole thing changed over the course of 67. Uh, people sat down and watched the show instead of danced and yeah. partook. Uh, be, they became entertainment. The drug scene changed a lot. Right. The whole pr perspective changed. But in 1966, the game was on. Everybody was playing. Yeah. You go into these halls. You paid three bucks to get in, which was not a lot of money then. Uh, and 
you walked in and, and, and immediately you knew you were somewhere really special. So special that you knew everybody else knew that, that yeah. was in that room, and anybody who wasn't didn't. And it created an instant bond with the audience. You know, like you were saying, everybody was friends just right away. We just all knew each other. Yeah, we yeah. all figured this out. We were all in this, inside these doors. We had to be all the same thing. Yeah, in a way, it's like the difference between opera and church. In church, we want you to participate. We want you to sing along, even if you're terrible at singing. <laughs> but if I go to the opera and start singing along, I'm not, <laughs> not going to be the most popular person in well, my Mal life. Malcolm, <laughs> let, let me ask you a couple of questions yeah, as yeah, long definitely. as I'm up here. Because, Completely. This is know, like a big chance. It, it's, it, I'm so excited to be here in Grace Cathedral. Yeah. And, yeah, and, exactly. and invited to talk about dirty hippies and rock and yes. roll. Yeah. Uh, a, a, you know, I come from the basement of society, and here we are up in one right, of the upper exactly. levels. Exactly. But uh, <laughs> the highest level. <laughs> <laughs> but let me ask you. I mean, are you yeah. aware uh, uh, that this whole thing that we're talking about had a, a, a terrifically important spiritual component? Yeah, I definitely am. I mean, so I mean, I, I'm glad you asked that. I didn't. My stories aren't as interesting, but so I am. Um, <laughs> I'm somebody who was who was born in the summer of love. I mean, so so my my so my there are people in my parents' generation who are who were who got it, and there are people who just were completely oblivious to it. And so so in a way, it's almost like it's like it's like it's like that old surfing joke. You know, I mean, you get to the beach, and the guy says, "Oh, you should have been here yesterday." Yeah. You know, I mean, it, when the surf was twice as big, and the winds were offshore, and it was really beautiful. Um, so, so going to college in Berkeley, uh, you know, I would look at the Grateful Dead. I'm like, you know, I, I can imagine really liking a band's music, but I can't imagine liking the band's music enough to go to like 40 of their concerts in a, you know, in a summer. Um, so, so, so that's where I stepped into it. You know, so Alan Watts and Bishop Pike and um, Houston Smith, that was a, 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 a really close friend of mine um, from, from Berkeley. So I, I, I'm connected to that spiritual part of it. Um, in a way that, that, you know, is being someone who came after and, and, you know, wasn't there, obviously. But yeah, so I am aware of that, 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 that sense. I mean, Houston Smith used to talk about, you know, taking LSD in, in you know, the church, in, in Boston University Chapel and it, it, having a, just a profound religious experience. Um, and then also realizing that he should never do that again, that it was, <laughs> you know, it was a one-time thing and, you know, that, that he could see becoming kind of a crutch for him or, or uh, you know. But yeah, so, so that's, what, that's what I think of is, you know, in terms of this, you know, and, and for me, I, you know, that living over, having the draft, you know, being, having the threat of going to Vietnam um, and having to kill people that you don't know, to be shot at and killed by people you don't know. I mean, I, I think it's, it's kind of like the dark side that, that, that almost made what the summer of love is possible. Um, and that, that feeling of just like, you know, the, the, the Cold War, the, oh, should I register for the draft stuff? I mean, that still was part of my childhood, too. But it was just... You look a little, little young for the draft. Yeah. Well, but, now uh, I'm a little bit old for everything. The, 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 the <laughs> draft made uh, uh, political activists out of all of us. Yeah, exactly right. You know, exactly so, right. Suddenly we had what they call now skin in the game. Yeah, exactly. It, and, and you know what it means? It means that, that, um, it, that it, there's a reason to, to, to doubt everything. I mean, if all these institutions, if, 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 this, if the United States government is going to send you to be killed in South Asia, then, then why should you trust the U.S. government about anything else? And, and then you get to qu questioning all those different institutions. And yeah, I, I, think, I think it had, there, there, it had, there was a driving force that that part of it was a really major part of it. The hypocrisy of uh, American life in the mid 60s was abundantly evident to young people and it wasn't just Vietnam. I think the first thing that came up was the civil rights movement yeah. and the recognition that not all of our citizens were treated with uh, right. equanimity and, and that there was uh, uh, powerful forces that, that were keeping that that way. Um, that was the beginning of that. Uh, uh, I think then the war Accelerated sort of slowly that. came into focus over 65 to 68, the Tet Offensive really. I mean, that just went through an entire generation yeah, and, yeah. And, and scared the living but Jesus. Yeah, so I mean, the, in the, it's like four months later that everybody got a draft number. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. But yeah, so, so, so that's, that's where I come at it. I mean, that's where, it, you know, but like I said, I wasn't there, um, but I saw everything that was, you know, you know arrive in Berkeley in, in, in 70s is where I first start become conscious of it. Cambridge, Massachusetts in the 70s there. I mean, there was a kind of a, a feeling, a warmth, a... I don't know. They're, they're just they're hippies everywhere, and it was, 
I don't know, it just seems... Yeah. Hippies have become an enduring American archetype. They have, they they're, have. They're, they're, so I'm, I've been thinking about that so much. So, so I mean, that's kind of like our, <laughs> like, where did hippies come from? Cowboys and, and Indians. Yeah, yeah, completely. That's, you wrote that. You wrote that. <laughs> yeah, I did. Yeah, they're, they're yeah. just in the same way. We have, we've invented a, and they're the San Francisco archetype. That we, we have no idea that that was going to be that way when it was going on. I mean, you have no idea uh, how... Uh, hated hippies were um, the mayor in 19 in April of 1967 made a statement that was quite clear he told everybody that was coming to San Francisco to that summer to stay away yeah. that was mayor uh, Shelley Aliota was elected that yeah. November and he was no friend of the hippies either he was the one that turned hate street into a one-way street uh, and uh, the board of supervisors actually voted a uh, resolution. There was one uh, uh, dissenting vote. Stay away, kids. Yeah, yeah. So the hippies were officially not welcome. They were officially a scourge. They were officially a pariah. And, and, and unofficially, we were beaten, we were spit on, we were insulted. Yeah. Uh, if you went into the wrong restaurant with hair over your collar, uh, the, the, the guy behind the counter would say, what can I do for you, ma'am? Yeah, yeah. Honest. And yeah. so now here we are 50 years later, and we're these honored citizens, right? <laughs> we're the guys that made San Francisco San Francisco, and now we're all welcome, yeah. and, you know, we're in right, the right. De Young Museum. Well, even Holy you look cow. at the De Young, the, but the De Young Museum <laughs> photographs don't, I mean, they, the people just don't look that, they look, it just doesn't, they don't look that, that wild. I mean, I, you know I mean? Uh, yeah, pretty tame, huh? Yeah, it does. Yeah, it no, and you'd, really go, you'd grow your hair, you know, two inches, and people go, ooh, you're growing your hair, you know? Yeah, like, yeah. And I, exactly I remember right. in the 80s, going to Salt Lake City for a family reunion, you know, the, the part of my family I call the Mountain Jews. And uh, the, uh, 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 I hadn't seen the skin oh, yeah, right behind the back of people's, people's <laughs> collar since the 60s. And there was Salt Lake City. Wow, everybody's got skin above their collar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I, I, I've, I've been thinking about this 50th anniversary and just wondering if we're ever going to celebrate. There's, like, is there going to be a 100th anniversary of the summer? So, <laughs> no, I'm, uh, no, I've been thinking about this too for a long time, yeah. Malcolm. And, and it's going to come down to like a Memorial Day parade with some guy in a wheelchair waving at the crowd. <laughs> exactly, well, he'll be the, the last, last hippie. hippie. The last hippie, that's right, that's right. Yeah, Civil but, War veterans, you know? Yeah, exactly, yeah. that's what yeah. Civil War, or for me, um, World War One veterans. <laughs> yeah, they're all gone now. <laughs> they are all. Yeah, the gone. last Tommy died a few years ago in yeah. England, so no yeah. more no more World One One veterans. Yeah, exactly. So it's we wouldn't even notice in this country. It wasn't a big war for us. England, different thing. Huge, but, yeah. huge thing. So, so um, tell tell some stories about like like Janis Joplin or Bill Graham. I mean, who are <laughs> some of the people that you just you, you know thought were the? I mean, who are like the top three hippies in San Francisco or the most influential hippies? Or, so. Or influence the consciousness. I mean, I'm, I'm, this is such a strange time, strange and wonderful. I, I, I was speaking to my friend last night about my buddy Bob Class. Now, now I, I knew Bob uh, through a mutual hobby that we followed. Uh, he went to Cal Berkeley. He was a really uptight Jewish guy who had a nattering mother and a father dying of Parkinson's curled oh, up yeah, in the corner, yeah. and he was. Straight arrow. He was a member of Pi Lambda Phi, ready to oh, yeah. you know, go through the you know whole deal and become the center. So Bob gets uh, uh, curious about psychedelics, and he takes a massive, a heroic dose of, of mescaline. <laughs> Wakes up the next day, having had a wonderful experience. He goes to the bank. He empties his bank account and walks down the street with a set of $20 bills, giving it away. Wow. And he gives away his bank account in about an hour and a half, and wow. then he goes over to the loan office that has his car loan and leaves his car keys there. And wow. I saw him the next day. You know, he came by our apartment to tell us about his wonderful revelation. <laughs> I want, I'm here to tell you, yeah. I have never seen anyone happier. Wow. He was beyond happy. He was glowing so his cheeks were still red. Now. I, you know, a couple days later, yeah, right, right. Yeah. you know, yeah. but I mean, this was like, uh, 
I don't want to say this is a common occurrence, but we all understood it. You know, yeah, we, yeah. We, st- we took it in the stride. I remember sitting around the apartment going, oh, great, Bob, Bob, you're fantastic. <laughs> Congratulations. You gave away all your money. That's <laughs> 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 uh, well, the first step. <laughs> that's the first step. <laughs> oh, that's great. What's the next step? <laughs> so, 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 yeah, we have this great archetype, and, and Bob got it, you know? Bob got it. Bob so, got yeah, it. Bob, so, Bob, so, but Bob. who invented that archetype? Like, how did it come to be? Like, like who decided that hippies were going to wear tie-dye or have long hair? Or, I mean, like, how did, how did that come into being? How did you invent? I mean... So all this emanates from the 1964... Uh, uh, production of the first uh, private synthesis of LSD. LSD yeah. And that's our man, Augustus Stanley Owsley III. Right. And he sat over in Dow Library, where you've spent plenty of time yourself, yeah. for two weeks. Doe Library. Oh, okay, Doe, yeah. yeah. But yeah, it was the one thing, that, the only mistake that you made. Uh, yeah, he sat over there yeah, yeah, for read two the weeks books. reading scientific data yeah. and then made I can see stuff. why you say Dow too. I mean chemical and <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so he's there two yeah, we weeks have reading the, the books, like looking at Berkeley. all the <laughs> Yeah, he figured it out and he makes the uh, LSD in 1964 in Berkeley and um, that's the beginning of Bear Laboratories. And Bear Laboratories manufacture we're not sure. Somewhere between the first million and first five million doses of LSD that came out of Berkeley. So it didn't really, you know, it sort of spread, sort yeah, of seeped right. out of Berkeley in 1964. And I, and I can't uh, overstate the significance of LSD for a cultural catalyst in San Francisco in 1965. And you wonder, you know, well, where'd the tie-dye come from? Well, colors <laughs> yeah, <laughs> suddenly yeah. became important. Right, right. <laughs> There was a sybaritic side to this. There's no question. And as with all utopian movements, this whole thing was quickly undermined by the non-responsive individuals that were attracted to this. But in addition to this sybaritic side, there was a profound and important spiritual element. Right, right. Very important. And uh, this was uh, the beginning of a new community. And that, that was the, the, the seed of the new community. Yeah. Uh, and very quickly, people that had the LSD experience sought out other people who had had the LSD experience. Right. And then there came to be these centers of activity where people could congregate, like the acid test. I mean, Ken Kesey uh, was an original, one of the original LSD evangelists. He encountered it in... Um, uh, being a hospital volunteer right, right, down exactly. in Stanford and yeah. experiments being run by the CIA, yeah, who once during the 50s, they were fascinated with LSD, yeah. sprayed a cloud of it over San Francisco to see how it would disperse in civilian populations. Why'd they pick San Francisco? I don't know. <laughs> uh, you know, this was where you sprayed the LSD, not Topeka, you know? <laughs> right, don't do it in Topeka. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, Kesey, his sense was that you wanted to take this out in the world and, and interact and, and use this energy to create bonds of communication. Whereas the East Coast side of this, the Millbrook gang, right, right. Leary and Alpert, yeah, yeah. They, they saw this more as a doorway to Eastern mysticism. And prior to the hippies and LSD, of course, Eastern mysticism in this country was a joke. It was like something in Ripley's Believe It or Not, you know, guys lying on beds of nails. Right, right, right. right. But yeah, those cartoon kind the of hippies embraced Eastern mysticism yeah. and they opened the door to it in this country. So every time you see a yoga studio in a strip mall, think Haight Ashbury. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You know, so it, these were two diametrically opposed sort of uh, approaches to, to this new vista that the LSD provided. Uh, and Kesey's approach ended up creating these happenings, as they right, were called, right. which turned into the, the rock dances. And really, the, the, the secret of the Avalon and Fillmore's 1966 is they were LSD speakeasies. Yeah, yeah. Now, we were talking earlier about, like, an audience where everybody's on LSD right. and, and, you know, like, 
Grateful Dead, New Year's Eve, 1968, Winterland. 5,400 people in the audience on LSD, six people on stage on <laughs> LSD. Very sensitive, in tune environment. Yeah. Very. Talk about group mind. Right, right. Right there in front of you, you could feel it. Everybody was just completely locked in to the collective subconscious, and I've never had that experience anywhere else. You know, I mean, Tom Wolfe's book, Electric Kool Aid Acid. Written test. by someone who obviously didn't take LSD. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I, <laughs> I, I wonder, um, you know, like, what did you like about it? What did you hate about Loved it? Loved the book. Tom Wolfe's a hero to me. Yeah. I just, I just find the guy's writing so vital and robust. And, yeah. and, so the right stuff is one of the great epic uh, yeah, right. American uh, histories. Yeah, he's just a brilliant guy, and and writing that book Bontire Vanities to the Deadline because yeah, he wanted yeah. to see how Dickens did it. I mean, you just as a writer, you just sit back and go, "Wow, yeah. dude!" And he dresses so well. I know completely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the and and the uh, Electric Kool Aid Test is a wonderful book. Yeah, uh, but it's clueless. Yeah, it's 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 a guy standing there saying, "Look at all these clowns." Without knowing what the joke is, right, right, exactly. Yeah, well, that's the way he, um, like, the, he wrote the Pump House Gang about surfing, and it's the same thing. He's just a total outsider, um, and you do appreciate his facility with language, but it, it, it's hard for him to to understand. And that's why I always wondered about um, the right stuff. Like, how, how is that? The, is that right? Is that uh, I, he I heard Jaeger <laughs> talk about it, oh, yeah. and, and and also had a conversation with Al Warden about it. Uh, and there's another guy, Buzz, Buzz Aldrin. Oh, yeah, Buzz Aldrin. I've Aldrin, talked yeah. to all three of those guys. And what did they say? They said, uh, Warden said the guy spoke to him for four hours, never took a note, and repeated verbatim what he said in, in, in the Rolling Stone article. He yeah. was just astonished. He said yeah. the guy has a tape recorder in his brain. Yeah, yeah. Aldrin said that the guy described what it was like to be on the moon as well as he's ever read it. Wow. And, and, and Jaeger made fun of him for making him out as a hero. <laughs> <laughs> That's so Jaeger, though, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I'm no hero. <laughs> uh, exactly. That's great. So um, going forward, I mean, um, the, 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 as, as the music became more popular across the country, I mean, how did that affect the scene? You, I love, you said like a little thing, like it, it, it attracted people who were non-responsive. Yeah. Um, so, 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 so that's, I mean, we, we talked a lot about the beginning of, the, of this, like the seed of this. So, so what happened as that time went on and the non-responsives became more involved? Yeah, well, in so it's about April guy. 1967, and, and I'm sitting in an apartment in Berkeley with with a bunch of friends, and we're talking about what's going on. This was a very common thing. Pretty much, we talked about it every day. It was it was happening. It was right in front of. It was a significant issue in our daily lives. So we're this yeah, is all yeah. being processed, and we're sitting there talking about this. And this guy says, "It's April." This guy says, "You know, I hear a hundred thousand people are coming to San Francisco this summer." Everybody goes, "Yeah,", yeah. <laughs> and one guy says, "Now." if we can just figure out how to get a dollar from each one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so this set off alarm bells in my head. I'm like, wait, wait, this isn't what we were talking about. Uh, no, this, oh dear. Our little thing is going to be grossly misunderstood yeah. by all these Americans who have failed to evolve their consciousness. Oh dear, I'm leaving town. So I went to Indiana in June. Oh, wow. And I spent the summer in a small town in Indiana where there were no hippies and uh, no pot, no LSD. It was a dreadful time. <laughs> <laughs> but I missed this whole thing. Yeah, right. Right? And what happened was that these people did indeed descend on the Haight Ashbury, and they were not the pilgrims that we ex wanted. They were, pardon the expression, flotsam and jetsam that had washed up on our shore. Oh, yeah. Immediately, LSD went out the window and speed became the drug of choice. Right. Within a month, there were street battles between the police and these hippies. Now, the cops didn't like the hippies in 66, but they didn't fight. <coughs> hippies were not violent. They, they tamed the Hell's Angels. And then suddenly, they're throwing bombs at the cops and slashing their tires, and it's open warfare in the street. Uh, whoa! This is not what we came together to do. 
but this flood that came into this city, yeah. that's what they came to do. You know, some of the most tragic stories are, are, are people who are dying from heroin overdoses in, in your book. And, and um, mm, Nancy Gurley. That was, just, that was, I think that was the hardest thing for me. I mean, she went to read her son a, a, a story. and yep. Yeah, I mean, that was really, really hard. And I, I just, I, I, I mean, it, it must have been hard to maintain the same optimism and um, forward motion for the hippies when you... When you're oh, you see what cocaine did for the Grateful Dead. Yeah. You know, I mean... Uh, Drug culture is a tricky issue. And, I, I, and by the way, I rarely, and I'm, I'm conscientious about not referring to LSD as a drug. Have I done that here this morning? Because it's so. a chemical. Yeah. It doesn't act like a drug. A drug masks uh, natural events in your system. LSD creates a chain reaction in your blood, and it's gone from your system about 15 minutes after you ingest it. Whatever happens after that is a chain reaction that it triggers. It's organic. It's not like taking a sleeping pill. So I don't think of it as a drug. I think of it as a chemical. Right, right. And it's been just a, a I mean, uh, uh, my, uh, my great uh, uh, psychiatrist friend, Murray Korngold, who died in January, age 97, first discovered LSD in 1958. He had a practice down in Los Angeles in Beverly Hills with a guy named Oscar Janiger, who's kind of famous for this because he dosed Cary Grant. Uh, right, right, But Murray right. was dosing everybody he saw, too. Uh, and that includes Marlon Brando and Jack Nicholson and James Coburn. Uh, in 1958, there was no psychedelic culture to support the use of LSD. He thought it was just a psychiatric chemical that was a panacea to him, yeah. opening up extraordinary opportunities to get into people's uh, uh, personalities beyond therapy. And, uh, and he was pounding that stuff. Uh, in 1964, his associate Jack Downing was fired as a, a county uh, health director in San Mateo County because he was using LSG to treat alcoholics. And it was Jack's discovery that as little as one dose was effective therapy, huh. that you could give a drunk a dose of LSD and sober him up. So these guys were super excited by the discovery of this drug. You yeah. know, this was modern day where, you know, right. chemistry was about science, to solve all our exactly. problems and right. science was a new god. Yeah. And here was this personality drug that opened things, uh, opened your mind up to a parallel universe and uh, the opportunity for evolved consciousness. And so psychiatrists in the West Coast first discovered this, and they were the first guys to apply it. Now, when Kesey and Owsley start passing this out to the general public, now this becomes an open door to instead of just psychiatric benefits, but to everybody had a vision of a greater world, of a greater culture, of a community mm -hmm. that they could see on an evolved level where there would be no war, there would be no racial distinctions. Right. We would no all hungry, understand yeah. how we needed to be to live together, and we could do that in harmony and love. What a thought. That was the really intoxicating thought. Yeah, yeah. And so how did things degenerate? I mean, how did, how, how, why did speed t just become so popular? Well, world? human nature is human nature. Yeah. And, and we all have to regret that in our own lives from time to time. <laughs> yeah. But uh, to, to ask an entire community to live up to their best selves and, and, and their, their highest aspirations is really a challenge. Yeah. And um, we fell short of that. However, I feel like the bathtub may be empty, but I see the rings. <laughs> right, right. I do. And, yeah. and, and I feel like that however reviled, ridiculed, uh, uh, just objected to in every way all these sort of dopey ideals were, they don't go away. Yeah, yeah. They've stayed with us as like some sort of crusty remains of, yeah. of this failed social movement. Yeah, yeah. I wonder, you know, when you wrote Summer of Love uh, um, and, and people started getting back to you about what they read about themselves, I mean, what did people say about it? And, and did they, they feel you got it right or, you know? Um, oh, yeah, a lot of people. So this book, you know, Summer of Love, 
uh, it was very hard to title. Yeah, uh, I can imagine. And it's really. It's, I asked Stephen King for help on the oh, title. That's a good yeah, idea. yeah. He, he he said I'm good at titles. I like, we know that. <laughs> I'm terrible at titles because sermons don't have titles. You know, I mean. You're lucky just, you. Yeah, I'm yeah. really lucky. I don't write the. I never had to write the headlines either. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I would be terrible at that. But this this, this book, uh, you know, people pick it up thinking it's going to be about the girls dancing barefoot in the park. Right, right. Um, at one point. I wrote a blurb for the publisher that he never used. I can understand why. And let me see if I can remember it exactly. It said, gunplay, fist fights, betrayal, deceit, all in a day's work in the summer of love. <laughs> so some, some guy bought this book to make into a movie. He, he, he just oh. uh, had uh, the biggest non-animated movie in Disney Studios history, uh, a thing called The Santa Claus with oh, yeah, Tim Allen. Right. Now, I'm sure he's been totally forgotten in Disney by now, but at that time, he had a lot of clout, yeah, right? Yeah. He said, I want to make this movie. And now, I, and one of the most fun things to do with authors is sit around and talk to them about their stories about the movie business. <laughs> <laughs> and the, and, and, and uh, this, guy, this guy was great. He was so enthusiastic. And, and he's on the phone and, and, and paid me a lot of money and calling me all the time. And, and, and so I said to him, I said, but you know, Richard, the movie you're making, I mean, I mean, this sounds kind of like a happy, dippy, hippie frolic. I mean, my right. book's kind of dark. Yeah, right. He said, yeah, I know I didn't finish it. <laughs> <laughs> Did anybody have any just like strong objections and just said, hey, that's, you, you know, or... So Robert Hunter, the Grateful Dead's lyricist, thanked me for uh, writing a version of, uh, of, of Janis Joplin that he recognized. He said, subtle as a Mack truck, that girl. Yeah. Uh, Country Joe said, God, glad I didn't do any of that stupid crap <laughs> myself. Uh, Garcia loved the book. Okay, good. Uh, it's not, it, it's, it, it, you know, my um, mission when I went into this book was I wanted to know what it was like to be those people. Like to be right. the Jefferson Airplane when you are suddenly, you know, the heaviest hippie in the world. Yeah, right. Uh, what was that like? And, and the, the fact is it led to a lot of really outrageous behavior and, and, and personal uh, uh, oh, yeah. grief and all kinds of insanity. Well, and just and, intentions and it, between people who had been good friends before. All that. That's what it was. Well, so, that's just stuff writers love. Yeah. You know, crisis, conflict, confrontation, adversity. Yeah. Yeah. So this is just full of, you know, that kind of stuff. And the final scene is in Puerto Rico in 1971 when the uh, Santana band finishes up a, a, a tour and uh, the, the organ player tries to drown uh, the guitar player in the oh, pool. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> they have to pull him apart. He's holding Carlos under the water too long. And they, not, they realize they're not playing. <laughs> so, to, um, music history would have been so much different. It would have been. And, and this is music. I mean, what about like drama, um, the committee, right? The, Howard Hessman, just right on the board sturdy, things. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, so There's I, so much going on in San Francisco. The music it's what everybody remembers, right? Yeah. But on the poster art was unbelievable. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the uh, classical musicians uh, were way out in San Francisco in the 60s. People that uh, uh, in the third stream of music, uh, tape uh, uh, manipulation and, oh, yeah, and all right, that kind of wacky right, stuff. Right, right. Uh, Minimalism. Uh, the fine arts field was very influenced by this. Uh, literature. Uh, th I mean, there wasn't an, a realm of the creative arts that people didn't take acid and go work on it <laughs> and then and, and, and see the interdisciplinary nature of it, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, a, a, a real great example is, is Ed Hardy. And Ed Hardy was a graduate of the San Francisco Art Institute in 1967, and he was offered a fellowship as an engraver at the Yale uh, uh, Art School. Yeah. And he said, no thanks, I want to do tattoos. Now, tattoos at that point were something you did to sailors and drunks. Right, right. They, they, they were unspeakably uh, low rent. Uh, <laughs> but Ed had seen the art in it. And he wanted to pursue that. And he saw it in the most flimsy way. It was years before he discovered, it was a couple years, three years, or four years before he discovered the Japanese tattoo oh, yeah, tradition. Right. And then he realized that he'd been right all along. 
And at age 20 something, he went over to Gifu and tattooed Yakuza for a year just so that he could learn that yeah. and, and then came back and became the first American tattoo artist to do that kind of work. So, Summer of Love, yeah. Hippies, San Francisco Free Thinking, led to the modern tattoo. Yeah, right. And that's just wow. one of the yeah, streams that come out. Yeah, I remember the first time out. I ever saw what about What about Whole Foods and organic thing? Oh, yeah, right. I, mean, I remember those, those hippies on Mission Street when they started Rainbow Grocery. Anybody else remember that yeah. joint? Yeah, I mean, that was like the first cooperative of that sort in the country. Every city in the country has one now, and it got formalized and turned into a ma major yeah, corporation right. by the Whole Foods guys. But you look at, you know, any time you see organic food, think hippies. Yeah, yeah. So we, um, one of our traditions is that we take questions. So if you have a, you have a little card on your table or chair, and um, we'd be happy to um, take any questions that you might have. So, um, as you look forward to like the future of rock music, and huh. like, <laughs> did, were you surprised by by what, um, which, how 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 these um, rock bands from the '60s and se early '70s were received? Like, like that some lasted and others didn't. Did that surprise you at all? Or well, so it was like being on a wave for 25 years. Yeah, you know, being at the Fillmore and dropping acid and dancing to the Grateful Dead. I had no idea that that was going to be one of our generation's signal events, right? right, right. right. And, and so that wave just carried on through the 80s to the point where the culture was completely captivated by this myth-making that was going on yeah. in the popular music arena. And it sort of peaks in the middle of the 80s on one side, you have the whole uh, history of rhythm and blues being summed up by Michael Jackson. And on the other side, you have the, the, uh, the for lack of a better word, the, the white American uh, musical traditions emanating from the hillbillies and Woody Guthrie and yeah. all that coming to a peak with Bruce Springsteen. Uh, and like all art movements, you know, they start out with borrowing ideas from the avant-garde that melds into the mainstream and then this repeated until the point where the ideas become diminishing returns and they go over the backside of the bell curve. And I, I sort of see that in the history of rock right around 85 when you have the Michael Jackson turning into Bobby Brown and Bruce Springsteen turning into Bon Jovi. Oh, yeah, right. You know, because I, I mean, growing up, I mean, I, I never knew of any time when there wasn't rock music. And right. all, you know what I mean? So it, it is strange to think. I mean, it just seemed like it was permanent in the same way. So those of us who remember rock and roll emerging, it was, Malcolm, it was a gift to us. Yeah, yeah. It was something that had been visited upon us that right. was there to save us yeah. from such dreary, grim prospects. Right. And right. it was a bright light in a dim world. Yeah. Uh, and really and truly, I've come to regard it as our generation's uh, most significant effort at creating culture. And, yeah. and we did. And it's a global culture, and, and, and its roots are deep, deep, deep in American history. Yeah, right, right. I like that, those connections, too, between that folk tradition and, you know, and you know, the, you know, the rhythm and blues tradition, too. Okay, were there personalities who participated in both the Berkeley and San Francisco movement or were they parallel movements? So the Berkeley and San Francisco thing was interesting. I, I uh, thought that was interesting too. I wanted to ask about that. The Come Berkeley on. side of the movement was a much more outspoken and political activist thing. The San Francisco thing, much more sybaritic. And the dialogue between these people could overlap in interesting and, and unproductive ways. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's great. Yeah, Country Joe and the Fish. Um, ver the East Bay mu music scene versus San Francisco music scene is kind of like a, do you have anything more to say about that? Well, uh, the Berkeley uh, has a, a diverse music scene, but the, the basic distinction that we're talking about here is that the Berkeley uh, campus was such a uh, hotbed of political activism yeah. that it really infected the entire countercultural movement over there. Yeah. And it was kind of a lead with that. 
Although then Alice Waters showed up, right? And everybody started eating granola for breakfast. <laughs> uh, but that was a few years away. Yeah. So in the 60s, the, the Berkeley were the, the radical firebrands that pressed for political action. And in San Francisco, the hippies were more psychedelicized and look at politics as a kind of personal issue, not yeah. a social issue. Yeah. It is not how things are done but how you live your life. And that was the personal politics of the Haight-Ashbury. Yeah, here's a long question. Can you share the true reality of the Summer of Love? Right now in SF, the arts and city institutions are mythologizing it for commercial pur purposes. <laughs> Yet, Paul McCartney described the scene not one of love and beauty, but one that was dangerous because of the serious health, safety, human reality, period. McCartney said he and the Beatles were shocked at what they saw since so many young people were in a bad state. Can you comment? Was it, we got Cart McCartney and Harrison confused. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, so in June of 67, about two weeks before the release of Sgt. Pepper's, Paul McCartney flew to San Francisco. No, George Harrison. No. Oh, Paul McCartney. We'll get to Harrison. <laughs> <laughs> he borrowed Frank Sinatra's Learjet, and walked into a Jefferson Airplane rehearsal carrying a test pressing of Sgt. Pepper's under his arm, unannounced. You can only imagine, Yeah. right? So they took him over to the, the, the uh, airplane mansion at 2400 Fulton, and they fed him full of DMT, which is a hugely powerful and intense psychedelic drug that lasts about an hour. They called it working man's acid. Uh, and they sat around and listened to this test pressing of Sgt. Pepper's. Now what Sgt. Pepper's was, you understand, was it was the Beatles' idea of what San Francisco was without having actually heard it. <laughs> That's great. I'm going to write that down. Uh, it's so true. <laughs> the English were fascinated by what was going on in San Francisco. It seemed like so quintessentially crazy American stuff that, uh, that they were utterly fascinated, and they recreated as much of it as they could. But, of course, there were no films, there were no records, yeah. there were no tapes. They were just guessing, and there was very little LSD in England. So the, 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 it's like, I love what these kids are trying to do sort of thing. But so they show, McCartney shows yeah. up, he spends the day with the airplane, gets high, leaves town. Yeah, there's no problem with San Francisco. But in August, Harrison shows up and he decides to walk through the Haight-Ashbury out to Golden Gate Park. Now by August, it's a war zone. Yeah, right. There are no San Franciscans on the street. Yeah. They're all kids that have come from out of town. They're all on speed. The They're non responsives. All, the non responsives. And uh, it's just, it was a horrible scene. Uh, and he's followed by a hundred of these kids as he walks down the street. And he never took drugs again the rest of his life. Yeah. Uh, it, it, excuse me, marijuana not accepted. Yeah. But yeah, that was the, that was the end yeah. of his psychedelic world. There were spiritual elements in the hippie ethos, interest in Eastern religions, Jesus freaks. What became of that impulse? Oh, it just grew, right? I mean, yoga. Yeah, uh, we have 650 people practicing yoga on Tuesday nights in Grace Cathedral. I, I mean, you, I, 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 yoga 50 years ago was for funny looking guys wearing diapers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But really, the, the whole thing, Open the door to Eastern mysticism in such a broad way. I mean, the ideas of Hinduism and Buddhism and, and, and even Islam had never experienced any kind of uh, circulation in, in our society or, or gained any credibility. Uh, and everything from like small, stupid acceptances of, 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 of uh, practices that these people did to uh, the development of, of uh, one of our generation's great thinkers, which is Ram Dass. Oh, yeah, right. Uh, who was Richard Alpert and yeah. Leary's partner. And he's come to be one of you know, the real great spiritual teachers of our time. Yeah, that's true. Be here now. That's him. Um, who will be interviewed in your chair 40 years from now? Summer of Love marked a paradigm shift in America and the Bay Area. Could that interview be the tech revolution with San Francisco being the center? God, can you imagine that? Oh my God. <laughs> you know, 50 years later, they didn't have tech Silicon Valley, you either. know, I mean, <laughs> wow. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I remember in the 80s they said comedy was the new rock. 
and, and, and certainly, you know, it seemed that way for a moment with this tremendous amount of, uh, of talent that just sort of emerged out of nowhere, most notably Robin. Uh, yeah. But uh, uh, tech has had such an impact on our city's culture. Uh, um, I, I, I used to think that the most dramatic change in our life in San Francisco in my lifetime was the AIDS uh, Oh yeah, that's true. Uh, play. Right, the AIDS that, that it just was, uh, there was San Francisco before that and there was San Francisco after yeah. that. And, and it happened like a light switch going out. Yeah. Uh, one night you're out and the restaurants and clubs are full and the next night you're out and there's about a third missing. Yeah. And they're, all, all the guys are gone. Right. Uh, if they weren't sick or dying, they were home scared. And it just totally changed San Francisco nightlife, San Francisco culture, San Francisco's entire fabric. Yeah. Because those guys weren't just one third of the audience. They were the party starters. They were the guys up in the front of the stage with their shirt tied around their waist yeah. going, yeah, 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 you know. Uh, they were over tipping the waiters. I mean, they, 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 were, they were the ones that made the city just yeah. <laughs> They were the spark plugs. Yeah. And suddenly they were gone and the place was quiet and boring. What's and the uh, that's when the dot commers showed up and they were just a complete drag. They were these yeah. super serious little kids that stayed in their jobs until 10 o'clock at night. They came out, had dinner at some expensive brew pub, and, 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 then at midnight, <laughs> and, and then at midnight they went out to do clubs. And what they wanted to hear in the clubs was they wanted to hear ironic bands, like disco bands or new Ironic wave bands. bands. And, and <laughs> so it was the end of the original music scene in San Francisco. Uh. That was it. Boom. They killed it. And so now we have these humorless hipsters that, <laughs> uh, uh, that uh, are, are out, there, out to make it rich. And, and, and I'll go back to Donovan, Season of the Witch, you know, filthy beatnik out to make it rich. Yeah. I just, I've just always been suspicious of that. So I don't think these guys, they may be hipsters, but they're not hip. <laughs> and their values uh, are really questionable as far as I can tell. I live in Cheryl Hill. I don't know if the uh, uh, housing thing is going on in your neighborhood. Yeah. But they're popping up 400 unit apartment buildings like, uh, you know, uh, I, I change shirts. Yeah. Uh, and we're going to, what was this, 40 years from now? Yeah. Hell, 20 years from now, we're going to sit here and wonder what the hell did we do to this city? I'm sure of that. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's, it, it, this is an old San Francisco song, you know, surfers, you should have been here yesterday. <laughs> but, I mean, I mean, I heard it all my life. My parents, you know, said, oh, man, you should have been here yesterday, you know, San Francisco before the war. <laughs> <laughs> Santa Monica in the 1920s. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the birth control pill was introduced to the public in 1967. Was that another influence on the Summer of Love? The no. birth control pill was... Okay, that's good. Well, it, was, it was slow to uh, 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 be adopted. Uh, it, 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 it took a couple of years before everybody was taking it. Um, and the other thing that came out there around there is pantyhose, which I also, uh, which I also sort of somehow connect. You know, the end of the garter belt and uh, uh, sexual freedom uh, that's afforded by the birth control pill, uh, and th that that fit in science and yeah. society, fitting into a social movement wondering about the sexual oppression of the 40s and 50s and suggest, thinking that that, trying to rethink that. Yeah, you know, that's interesting that technology too is, I mean, it's so connected to, to writing and media. I mean, what the newspaper industry looks like now versus you know, the way it was 15 years ago. Shadow, uh, you know, it's a shell, it's yeah, a it's hulk. Yeah, it's a shell yeah. of itself. So when I went to work for the newspaper, it was the center of the city's life. The TV stations waited to pick up the morning paper to find out what to put on their news show that night. And the guys that worked in the paper were like swashbuckling pirates. Yeah. Each one of them had had more than their ration of grog, too. <laughs> it was like that. Uh -huh. I mean, I had a friend whose dad was in the newspaper biz, and that was... But, I, 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 you know, it, so what's going to happen? Like, how... I, I mean, we had, you know, the newsroom in Los Altos in the Los Angeles Times has got, like, a third less people in it than it did, like, 12 years ago. I'm so proud of the news business these days. I'm, I got to say... Yeah. Uh, you know, for a hollow, shelled out industry, you know, they have stood up in the last few months where nobody else has been able to, and they've accounted for themselves 
like the fine gentlemen that I've come to think they are. I'm yeah. really proud of the yeah. news media today. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay, um, just a reminder. The Summer of Love also influenced all other countries on the globe. Like I was the only hippie on a remote Caribbean a island. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, it was, like I said, this is an archetype that just that just rung throughout the world, and there, there is no rem corner of the world now too remote not to have a hippie hacky sacker. Yeah, right. Exactly right. Um, um, number one, having mentioned that acid's chemical effect is short-lived and the subsequent trip is the result of one's subconscious environment, do you believe one's subconscious environment can be triggered in this way without acid? Question mark. Meditation? Question mark. No question about that. People have religious experiences and, and spiritual uh, uh, awakenings all the time for many, many reasons. I mean, uh, the, popping into my head is, uh, is Bill W., the founder of uh, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, who, oh, yeah, who had right. a brilliant spiritual experience in the 30s that led to this creation of this spiritual movement. And, and, and pardon me, it's the greatest spiritual movement of the 20th century. There's no yeah, question. Definitely. Um, and by the way, Bill W. took acid many times trying to recreate that spiritual experience. Yeah, yeah. Um, the second question is, is there, any, this is the, so it was two part question. Two part, yeah. Is there any real LSD available to this day? Man, you know, the stuff I'm finding these days just isn't as, you know. <laughs> yeah. so, and, and if you're really interested in, the, in, in that, uh, you, you dig out on the internet. Somewhere around 2011, 2010, they arrested a guy in Berkeley for having cornered the ergot market. And the ergot, ergot's a key ingredient of uh, uh, LSD manufacture, and it's almost entirely made in the former Soviet Union. And this guy got himself appointed trade commissioner to the Soviet Union by the Bush administration, pretty much just to set up this deal. And it's one of the most amazing, uh, bold, uh, crazy criminal enterprises I've ever read about. And uh, it, it caused uh, the LSD market to just disappear entirely around 2010 because he had all the, the stuff and n nobody could make LSD but him. And when he, went when he got arrested, the supply ended. Oh, yeah. That was a good second part of the question. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got to go because I've got to go to church upstairs at 11 o'clock. Right. We'll but, go uh, from spiritual to religious. Well, yeah, well, both. Well, you know, a little religious down here, a little <laughs> spiritual up there. But um, yeah, the, I, I wonder, you know, you look at me and my generation as we look back on, on the Summer of Love. And, and I, you know, I, I do think we have all, all, all of us have been influenced by the hippies. We have a little hippie inside of us. We can kind of love that part of ourselves. Um, what do you hope is the, the like, lasting legacy of the hippies? And um, you know, what signs of hope do you see for the future? So the lasting hope, uh, the lasting legacy of the hippies, peace and love. Peace and love. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, it, 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 it's, it's just, it's a ticket we all endorse. Um, and the hope for the future is that we'll all rally around peace and love again. Yeah. They, they are enduring virtues. Yeah, they are. Joel, thanks so much for being here. Oh, Malcolm, um, this is great. Oh, so great. It was so great to um, have you. I'm, I, I'm, I'm so glad that you know, the book is so much about the music world. Um, it was really great to have you talk more about you know, the hippie experience, and I, I'm, I'm really grateful that you brought all that to us. It, 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 you know, like I said, it's, I, it's like I arrived, and everybody said you should have been here yesterday, and, and it really helped me to understand what it was all about. Well, we're glad you're here, Malcolm. Yeah, I'm, glad, I'm glad I made it. <laughs> glad I made it. So, and... Um, and, and, and Thank you all for coming. Yeah, I really yeah. appreciate you being here on Sunday morning. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. So this is our last forum for the, for the um, spring. We'll be um, reconvening in the fall. I think Garrison Keillor, is, I think he's our first one for the, for the next um, season. Um, but uh, we do rely on your donations. If you can make a gift to the forum, it helps us to be able to support it. Um, church will be starting at 11. And... Um, Look forward to, uh, Joel Selvin has a, there's a lot on the internet if you want to find out his take <laughs> on a particular musician or a particular experience. Fool's names and fool's faces. Easy.
easy to find him. So yep. um, thank you so much, Joel, for everything today. Great. Right. Thank you, Malcolm. Yep, thank you. This is a pleasure. Oh, such a blessing. Can we don't forget to